Welcome to the Southside online service. We hope you enjoy this presentation during these difficult times and we pray that God will be with you. This morning we're going to say goodbye to a couple of uh, great friends here at Southside that have been with us for a couple of years now. But more than just a goodbye, we're going to be able to commission James and Danae. They're headed to Lethbridge. Um, Danae has taken a position with InterVarsity Fellowship at um, the Lethbridge University. And so she's going to share a little bit about what they're going to be doing, um, especially her within her new role in this new exciting ministry venture. So uh, I'm actually, James and I both went to the University of Lethbridge. I was a part of the InterVarsity group when I was a student. And the year that I graduated was actually the last year that Lethbridge had a full-time staff worker at campus. Uh, the last few years, there's been someone that's been checking in on the group, um, but they haven't had anyone there full-time. And so an opportunity came up for us to consider moving back to Lethbridge uh, in the hopes of uh, being there full time and overseeing the group that is there um, and yeah really being present and in discipling and encouraging them in evangelism at the campus there. The other part of why we're going back is to actually plant a ministry to international students. There's been a growing number of international students coming to the campus and there's no one doing anything there. And so it was really on our hearts to go and be the ones to reach out to international students and to actually welcome them into our homes. So we're really excited about this new opportunity. We're really sad to be leaving Edmonton um, and especially sad to be leaving this church. Um, we've really enjoyed our time here and have yeah just been really blessed by our time here. So yeah, that's, that's what we're up to. So this, uh, this morning, we're going to commission them. We're going to pray over them. Um, we're going to wish them uh, great opportunities um, as God has called them and they're following his call to Lethbridge. And also as an opportunity, if you would like to support uh, Danae, especially in this work at InterVarsity, um, her email is up on the screen now. And uh, you can email her. She would be happy to send you updates about what's going on, um, as well as just be praying for her. Let, send her encouraging notes to let her know that you're praying for them. Um, as well as if you would like to financially support, that would also be an option. So just email Danae and she can hook you up with all of those different options of support. Um, but this, this morning, we're just joined together as a connect group here um, at the church to commission them, to pray over them, um, and just to, to pray God's blessing in their lives as they make this, this big move into this new venture of ministry that he's called them to. Um, so let's pray together this morning for James and Danae. Father God, we thank you that we can um, celebrate and commission your church to be the church. And so God, as, as sad as we are this morning to say goodbye to James and Danae as a part of our fellowship here, um, week in and week out, Father, we just want to praise your name that they are answering the call that you have placed on their lives to go and begin this exciting new ministry opportunity at the University of Lethbridge with international students, but also to carry on the work with that Christian club that's already happening there. Um, in support of those Christian students on that university campus. Um, God, we pray for their transition, um, that you will be in it all. We know that you've already been working behind the scenes in so many miraculous ways to make this move possible. And so we just give you them and give you this ministry that you've placed on their hearts and opened this opportunity for. God, may you just richly bless them. Be with the students at the University of Lethbridge, especially as everything is so up in the air with COVID and it's going to be online classes and, and how that might look. Um, God, I just pray for wisdom and clarity for Danae as she begins this ministry and leads this ministry, that you will just give her the strength that she needs, the patience that she needs, um, and that she will just see fruit in her in your time, God. Mm. Um, we just thank you for James and Danae. Thank you for the part of our church family that they've been with for the last two years um, and just how much significance they've been to us here in Southside. Um, and God, so we just pray your blessings on them as we commission them to go in your name. And we thank you for this opportunity to be ascending church. In your name, amen. Good morning. This morning our parable is in the book of Matthew, and it takes place just after Palm Sunday, when Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling that prophecy. The people are responding positively to him, shouting along the roadside, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. But more and more, the Jewish religious leaders have been questioning Jesus' authority. More and more, they're not happy with what's going on. Why? Well, because Jesus is challenging their authority. 
They see the people turning to Jesus and his talk of the kingdom. And ultimately, they see their own authority and power diminishing. They're losing control and they don't like it. Jesus has returned to the temple on this visit to Jerusalem to hold a series of debates. Well, I don't think he went to hold the debates, but this is what happened. As he was at the temple teaching, religious leaders came to him and began to challenge him and question him. And so he holds a series of debates with different groups of religious leaders. And these debates will eventually lead to the plot to kill and to um, arrest and to kill Jesus. Now, you might say it was the religious leader's final straw. The, the conversations that are going to take place at this time in the temple were all they could handle. It was it. But Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what had to happen. He knew that he was going to be facing the arrest, the cross, and ultimately the resurrection. And so at this time, there's no point in beating around a bush. Jesus is blunt. He's straightforward in his questions and in his accusations. Jesus is telling these religious leaders exactly what it is, exactly how it is. Jesus' response at the temple, knowing his death and the resurrection are right around the corner, hold nothing back. The leaders don't want to admit that God is at work. They've seen it. They can't deny that something is happening, that there is something about Jesus. They've seen the people, they've heard the stories, they've witnessed the miracles themselves, some of them even. They can't deny that, but they don't want to admit that God is doing something new. They don't want to admit that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, John came as that forerunner and, and they ignored him, and this is important in this parable. And now they just don't want to see Jesus either. Their power, their authority is too significant for them, and they're losing it, and they don't like it. And so within this context, we find this parable, and it's the first in the series of debates that Jesus has with these Jewish religious leaders. And it's the parable of the two sons, found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32. And this is what Jesus says. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. It's a short parable this morning. It's a short parable that might not be familiar to you. It's a unique parable. You know, in, in, in Jesus' day and day, in the context of this story, sons were expected to obey their fathers, regardless. Especially if they're still living in his house. Because if they didn't obey, it brought dishonor on the father, on the whole family. And that wasn't something you wanted to do. So this parable paints one of obedience, but also human responsibility. Son one initially rebels, flat out says, no, I'm not going to do that. I will not. But then Jesus says that he repents and he changes his heart and he goes and he does as his father asks. He turns his ways disobedience becomes obedience rebellion becomes surrender the father's will is done son number two he seems compliant i will yes sir initial obedience but he didn't follow through he spoke correctly but his actions did not accompany his words he spoke respect and obedience but his actions showed disobedience he didn't go both said sons said one thing and did the another. In fact, the opposite of what they said that they were going to do. So Jesus asked the religious leaders, which do you think did as the father wanted? Well, the obvious answer is, well, the first one. And they answer that. But here comes the twist, the challenge to their authority. When he says, you know, John came and showed you the way of righteousness, but you did not follow. You did not believe. But tax collectors and prostitutes those who 
the Jewish religious leaders would have deemed unclean, unworthy, unfit to be in the presence of God. Those people, they did believe. And they've done. They followed the will of God, the path of righteousness. You know, John came to prepare the way for the Messiah, and now here I am ultimately. You didn't believe him, you're not believing me. Even with everything that you have seen happen, you still are not in the will of the Father. Ultimately, your son too. You say the right words, but your actions are not following what you say you believe. You see, the kingdom of God is for those who follow. Not just in words, but for those who follow. And the seemingly disobedient, those who initially hold up their hands against, adamantly against what God has asked us to do, maybe even denying God, those are the ones who when hear the way of righteousness, hear the truth of the gospel, hear the beauty of the kingdom of God, repent, change their ways, change their hearts, change their minds to be in alignment with the will of God, they're entering the kingdom of God where the ones who have said, I believe and don't do, are left out. They're not in the will of God. That's, that's painful. You see, this, this parable is ultimately asking us to be obedient to the Father. And that responsibility that we have as humanity of those who say we are obedient to actually act on it. You know, we can't just say it. Our lives have to show submission, surrender, a yielding, a giving way, a bowing down to, a deferring to, a conforming to, consenting and agreeing to the will of God. Those who were following the will of God, even though initially they said no, have turned and followed. They've done it. They've changed their hearts and gone and done as the Father has asked. That's the will of God. That's kingdom living, the path of righteousness that Jesus says John speaks of, the journey of holiness in Nazarene language that we follow and we allow the Spirit to transform us into the image of Christ. It's obedience to the Father. Ultimately, it's going and doing when God asks us to. We can't just say we believe, we have to live it. You see, the kingdom of God is for all, and I hope that you've gotten that over this series, that nobody is excluded from the kingdom of God because Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and we are all in that boat. We are all in the same place in there. But hey, we have to obey. We have to repent and turn. We don't just get to be ushered into the kingdom with no no part of our own, no, no turning, no repentance, no acceptance of the grace of Christ. But we can't just say we believe. You know, Jesus didn't come and just say he was the Messiah. He showed us he was the Messiah by eating with those who were deemed unworthy, by healing, by compassion, by mercy, by justice, by all of his life. He showed us that he was the Messiah. He didn't just say it. And God is calling us to the same. He's calling us to be obedient. And he has asked us to go, to do, to be, not just to say that we believe. Religious leaders were all talk. They had it right. They knew what to say. They claimed to be living in the will of God. But as Jesus points out in this parable, ultimately, they're really only living for themselves, their own power, their own authority, their own will, not in submission to the will of God. You know, they kind of had gotten up on this soapbox, this higher than now mentality. They walked with their shoulders high, their heads, their chins up. You know, this haughty attitude of, I'm better than you because I know the will of God and I'm living in it. I'm better than you because I know everything that needs to be known in order to be a part of the kingdom. I am just so good and so mighty and so powerful. You know, there's so many other parables and stories that Jesus tells us where the religious leaders are always painted in this picture. You know, this, this son who just speaks it. And probably so quickly to say, yes, sir, I'll go, with zero intention in his head to follow through with that. You know, to be living in the kingdom of God, 
to be living in the will of God, our ways have to surrender to his ways. Our desires have to bow down to his desires. Our wants, our actions, our words, all that we have has to submit to him. And it's challenged me this week because I look at these two sons and I go, well, I hope I'm neither of them. I hope I'm maybe the third child that isn't mentioned in this parable that, that, you know, the father asked to go and he goes, yes, sir. And out he goes because he's excited to go work where the father has asked him to work. But at the same time, I think that, that Jesus only tells us these two sons because unfortunately, I think we find ourselves in one of these two sons' pictures. You know, maybe you are thinking, oh, I'm not one of these two. No, because I always say yes. But, but how many times has God asked you to do something and, and there's a hesitancy? Oh, but, but God, I, I like it this way. My life is comfortable as it is. Really? Do you really want me to do that? Oh, that's, that's stretching, God. You know, it's, it's not an outright no. It's not, a, it's not being disobedient right at the first. It's not saying, you know, you're not in defile. You know, you're not, you're not just like rebelling and saying, no, God, I'm not doing that. But there's this hesitancy. This, oh, but life is good, comfortable. I'm happy where I am. You're asking me to step out of my comfort zone, do something that I don't really want to do. Are you sure? You know, it's like when I asked Maddie to clean her room. There's a bit of whining and grumbling. Ah, later, I want to do this now. I want to do my own thing right now. Ah, do I have to? She's not saying no. But her actions are also not saying yes. Her, her words are also saying, I don't want to be doing as you ask me to do. I'll grumbly drew it. That's, that's not what God's asking us to do. He's, he's asking us to repent, to turn, to follow his will, to allow his will to become our own. You know, so maybe that hesitancy, and this is a challenge to me. Okay, God, do I, do I readily say yes and go? Like, I want to be this, this non-existent son in this story. Or do I hesitate? Well, do you know what? I'd rather hesitate in saying yes, you know, kind of do that grumbling along. I'd rather be slow to obey than and eventually follow than, than to say that I'm in the will of God and not have my life reflect it, which is the second son. Yeah, God, I'm there. I've got you. I've, I, I know what you're asking me to do, and I'm going to go do it. And then just carry on life. Just, you know, ignore it. Acknowledge it in the one instance and then just turn your back on it and go, okay, well, no, I'm just still, still do my own thing. It, it doesn't really matter what God's asked me to do. But I'm in the will of God because I said yes. You're not following. You see, to, to be in the kingdom of God, it, it is for all. It's open to all. But we have to repent and follow. We have to align our lives with his will. Follow Jesus. And you know, the more we follow him... The more we read his word, we find that will of God, what it looks like for our lives, because the will of God, although it's the will of God, will look different in each and every one of our lives because God's calling each and every one of us to do something different. He's created us all differently. He's placed us all in different situations, and he's calling us to live in his will in the situation where he has placed us, in the body that he has given us. In the, it's the surroundings that he has located us in. And so the will of God for me is going to look slightly different than the will of God for you. But we both need to be living in the will of God. Each and every one of us need to find the will of God for our lives. And it might ebb and flow and it might change direction as you go. You, you can't be guaranteed to just go, Kate, I've read my Bible once. I've got it. I know what I'm doing and then I'm good and just carry on. Because as life happens, God calls us and prompts us to be in his will each and every day. And so each and every day, we need to pick up his word. We need to be guided by him. We need to allow him to transform us into his likeness. That's that holiness, that life of holiness where we become like him. We're not going to become God. We're not going to become little gods with little G's, you know, like elevating up a ladder. But it's allowing Christ to transform us into his image his likeness. He has called us to be the kingdom of God on earth, to reflect him. 
This is what the parables show is, is what does the kingdom look like? It looks like this, it looks like this, it looks like this. Well, in this story, it looks like a son who obeys the will of the father, not in word, not just in word, but in action, in doing, just as Jesus did. And I guarantee that if every day you're spending time with Jesus, every day you're saying, God, today I give you today, Help me, guide me to be in your will. Open my eyes to see as you want me to see today, to circumstances, to people I might be passing on the street who need something from you. God, help me to see that and be that, that like conduit of your kingdom, your grace and your love here on earth. If you're doing that every day, those hesitancies, those little kickbacks and fights where you kind of are going, okay, God, but I'm comfortable here. I don't want to step out. I don't, I don't really want to do that, but I will. Those begin to lessen because as you become more and more in tune with the will of God for your life, it becomes natural. It becomes something that you don't even have to double think. You then become that son that Jesus doesn't talk about. The one who says yes and goes in excitement, in just a, a, just a determination to please the father because he's asked you to do something. It happens, but we have to spend time with the father. We aren't going to know the will if we don't spend time with the father. You know, the, the challenge of the Pharisees and that authority question was you say you know the will of God but you're not acting on it. You're not carrying through with what God has asked you to do. You're sitting in utter disobedience, even though you say yes. And what's worse for the Pharisees, and maybe this might ring a chord with you, and if it does, well, you know, Jesus challenges us through these parables today as much as he did back then when he was telling them firsthand to the people he was talking to. But maybe you're stead, sitting there saying yes, disobeying by not following through and then looking down on those who initially have said no, who've rejected by their lifestyle, by their, their attitudes, whatever it might be, have rejected the will of God and yet are being welcomed in. You're looking down on them going, oh, well, they're unclean. They're unworthy. There's no way they can be entered into the kingdom of God with that judgmental attitude of they're sinful. You know, look at the plank in your own eye before you start looking in the speck in theirs. Because when Jesus came, he came to call the sinner back to him. And we're all guilty. We have all been tarnished by sin. It doesn't matter if you grew up in church, let me tell you, you're probably most in danger of missing the kingdom because you know the motions to go through. You know that, you know, church on Sunday, we sing the songs, we stand when we're supposed to. Oh yeah, I help, I give, I do all these things. But do you really follow? Have you really given your life to him, to Jesus? Have you surrendered? Allow him to take your all, allow him to guide you, not just go through the actions of, of believing. That, that's not being obedient. You have to surrender your life. Give your all. When God asks you to go and do, you go and do. See, the church is called to be Christ's body here on earth. And unfortunately, we don't usually paint a very good picture. We like our rules. We like our order. We like the things as we're supposed to have. And, and sometimes I think we're, we're guilty of, of pushing people into our will the look of the church, the traditions of the church, the things that, you know, make us comfortable, that we all fit in together. We all like the same songs. We all stand at the same time. We all know what the offering plate looks like. We know all of these things that are just nice and teat and tidy. And they go, yes, we love Jesus and we love the will of God. But we're, we're, we're kind of like putting it into our own box. We're not allowing him to stretch us, to challenge us. You know, allowing him to say, okay, I'm, I'm bringing people into your fellowship and I, I've got to have you as a, as a body reflect me, which means don't make them like you. Don't make them look like you, act like you, talk like you. Let them be them. 
because they've surrendered to my will. I desire for them to surrender to my will, but I don't want them to conform to you. I want them to conform to me. How does that look for them? How does that look for you? How does that look when the kingdom of God is all colors, all nationalities, all walks of life together in one place, this beautiful image of the compassion and the mercy and the love of Christ? That's what the church should be. But we can only truly be that when we obey and follow when we allow him to push us out of our comfort zone and go. You know, his great commission, when he ascended, before he ascended on high, he said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, not baptizing them in the name of Jen or baptizing them in the name of Southside Church of the Nazarene, but baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples of me, not of you, not of your favorite speaker on YouTube, not of that evangelist that comes through and speaks great things, not of them, but of me. Go and make disciples. Go, not say, not think, not agree, but stay sitting down. Go, get up and follow. What's Jesus asking you to do today? Maybe it's something that's a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe for a few weeks you've been doing that, oh, but God, be that first son. Be the one who actually does the will of the Father. Don't be the one who sits there and says yes and does nothing. What's God asking you to surrender today? You see, to be in the will of God, it takes surrender. We have to give up ourselves in order to follow him. He calls us to pick up our cross daily and follow him. But you know, when, when we surrender ourselves, we're not giving up the best life we've ever known. We're gaining the best life we've ever known. Because when we surrender to the will of the Father, when we go and do as the Father has asked us to do, your life is going to be fuller and more complete than you ever thought possible by just speaking it or it being in utter disobedience. Because God desires life to the fullest for you. That's why he sent his son, so that we could be in right relationship with the Father so we could have that relationship where when he asks us to do something, we say, yes, Father, because I love you, because I know that you love me. And you're asking me to do this because you love me and you believe in me. You delight in me. You, you, you just have so much faith in that I can do this because you've asked me to do it, because you've given me the strength to do it. And so, of course, I'm going to follow you because I know that in following you, I find fulfillment that hole that's missing, that, that desire to fill with other things that I can never fill with other things before, it just suddenly is overflowing when I'm in your will, when I'm following and obeying you. So I, I think the challenge from this parable for us this morning is what is God asking you to do today? What's he asking you to surrender? What's he asking you to step beyond your comfort zone? And the challenge that Jesus gives us is you know the way of righteousness. You know the path to take. So take it. Do it. God, as we just come before you, I just ask that you guide each and every one of us. I know that you are there prompting our hearts, prompting our minds, our actions to be in your will. And God, some of us might be hesitant. 
maybe not just outright disobedience. Some of us are. And God, for those, I just pray for a softening of our hearts. I pray that you will just continue to speak gentleness and love and patience and just all of the things that we need spoken into our disobedient hearts so that we can turn and come and find you. For those of us who are a little bit more hesitant, a little bit more standoffish, a little bit more about God, again, I pray for a softening of our hearts, a daily just time with you. Allow us to have that time with you. You allow us, God. Help us to desire that time with you more and more, to be more and more in tune with you so that as we grow in you, those hesitancies just diminish and that being in your will is just second nature to us because we are so in love with you and so in love with who you stand for and what you are, God, that you have become one with us. We have become one with you, your spirit living in us, God, guiding us, leading us each and every day. And God, I pray for those who are speaking the truth, but whose lives don't reflect it. Prod us, God. With this parable that Jesus told, God, I pray that you will just kind of like push us to the next level of saying yes to you and having our lives reflected. God, we just thank you for, for the grace and the mercy you bestow on each and every one of us. And God, I pray that as a church, that we will be a true reflection of you. As we are scattered in so many places at the moment, that we will be shining your light in each and every location where we're at, God. God, we just, we give you this world. It's broken, it's hurting. The last few weeks have shown us more than ever how much we need you. We need you. And God, as those you have called, each and every one of us, that opportunity to, 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 to be your hands and feet, God, I pray for your strength and your spirit to dwell in us. God, we thank you. And we love you. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining us this week, and we hope you have a fantastic week. Uh, dive into your scriptures, dive into the will of God, and allow him to transform you in ways that you never thought possible. Bye.